Kelly. <clears throat> Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. <clears throat> At today's hearing, we will again examine influence peddling and the use of consultants to secure HUD moderate rehabilitation program funds. The Section 8 moderate rehabilitation program is intended to stimulate rehabilitation of substandard housing units by guaranteeing a rental income to the owner large enough to repay rehabilitation costs over a 15-year period. The program provides rental subsidies to lower income families living in the rehabilitated units. <clears throat> Many years ago, when my daughters were young and our family played Monopoly, when someone landed on chance, the most dreaded card was property repair. You had to pay for repairs for each house and you received nothing in return. In the real life game of Monopoly, played in recent years by consultants and others at HUD, the Mod Rehab Property Repair Card is one of the most sought after cards, perhaps second only to the get out of jail free card. In return for making repairs on the property, the cardholder receives millions of dollars in federal rent subsidies and tax credits. Our witnesses at today's hearing are Mr. Paul Manafort, Mr. Lawrence Gay, Mr. Richard Davis, the Washington consulting firm of Black Manafort, and Mr. Victor Cruz, who together with Mr. Manafort is a part owner of Seabrook <coughs> Apartments, a 326-unit project in Upper Deerfield, New Jersey. Mr. Manafort appeared before our subcommittee on June 20. There were a number of questions regarding his participation and that of other members of his firm in the Mod Rehab program, which were not answered at that appearance. We have invited Mr. Manafort and the other witnesses to appear today in order to resolve these unanswered questions regarding Seabrook Apartments. Since Mr. Manafort last appeared before us, we have also learned that he and his firm were involved in a number of other HUD-related activities, and we will raise some of these involvements today. I would like to emphasize that all of our witnesses are appearing on a voluntary basis, and we appreciate their cooperation. <clears throat> on November 14, 1986, Mr. Lawrence Gay, a former HUD employee, working for the Black Manafort firm, <clears throat> met with uh, Deborah Dean to discuss mod rehab funding for the Seabrook project. Subsequently, Mr. Greg Stevens, also associated with Black Manafort, and who less than a year earlier had served as chief <clears throat> of staff to New Jersey Governor Keene, set up a meeting with the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, Division of Housing and Development, which functioned as the public housing authority for the upper Deerfield area in New Jersey. According to the sworn testimony of Mr. Roy Ziegler, the chief of the Bureau of Housing Services, Fort New Jersey, who attended this November 19 meeting with Mr. Stevens and Mr. Cruz, they indicated that they had a commitment from HUD for the Seabrook project. Ziegler testified, and I quote, Mr. Cruz indicated that there were HUD secretarial discretionary funds available for the project at Seabrook, end quote. The New Jersey Housing Project Agency was told that it had to apply quickly for the funds, and the whole matter was one of great urgency. <coughs> Ziegler was told by Stevens to apply directly to Joseph Monticello, the administrator of the New York Regional Office, and to bypass the HUD area office in Newark, something which was not normally done. On November 20, the New Jersey Housing Agency, without the knowledge and consequently without any input from the local community of Upper Deerfield, New Jersey, applied to HUD for 326 units of moderate rehabilitation program funding 
and that the urging of Cruz and Stevens sent a blind copy of the application to Deborah Dean. HUD decided to fund the application, and early in January the funding document was issued. The state of New Jersey had not received a MOD Rehab Award since 1984. In February 1987, <coughs> CFM Development Corporation, C standing for Cruz and M for Manafort, signed an option on the Seabrook Apartments property. On April 24, the HUD field office notified the Public Housing Authority that, he, that it had been awarded these much in demand units. On May 18, the Public Housing Authority solicited bids from developers for these 326 units by placing a single ad in the Millville Daily, a local newspaper with extremely limited circulation. To no one's surprise, only one company could meet these tailor-made requirements and only one company responded to the bid. On June 1, the Public Housing Authority awarded the units to Seabrook Apartments owned by CFM Development. Mr. William Connolly, the, the Director of Housing for the State of New Jersey, told this subcommittee that the public notice advertisement for the bids was an absolute sham. An absolute sham. Connolly said <clears throat> they had no authority to move those units to some other project. Connolly testified, I quote, at no time from the time we were first contacted by Mr. Stevens <clears throat> and Mr. Cruz did we believe that the award would not, would not be made by HUD. There were clear indications right along that award was going to be made. It was no surprise when we received the allocation labeled specifically for Seabrook. Our role, as we saw it, <clears throat> was as administrator of HUD's commitment, the commitment decisions being made in Washington. It was not our decision to decide who was going to get the units." End quote. Last week, subcommittee staffers visited the Seabrook Apartments project in Upper Deerfield, New Jersey and met with numerous families living in the rehabilitated units. What they saw and what they heard was shocking, particularly for a project that is costing taxpayers $31,163,400 in rent subsidies alone, plus additional millions in tax credits. Subcommittee investigators entered the area on a narrow dirt road and saw row upon row of cinder block barracks. The low-income residents of these rehab rehabilitated rental units have to provide their own refrigerators. The subcommittee staffers saw a young mother who couldn't afford to buy a refrigerator and was doing without feeding her family canned goods with an infant whose diet was determined by what could be stored at room temperature. This was in an apartment that in a quasi-rural area of New Jersey is renting for $700 a month, most of it consisting of federal rent subsidies. Subcommittee investigators spoke to one woman who had lived in a one-bedroom unit that had, in her words, two big closets. After rehabilitation, the closets were, quote, converted, unquote, into two bedrooms. And this woman had to move because she did not qualify for a three-bedroom apartment. They heard complaints from tenants that the nearest public laundromat is at least a half a mile away on a highway to which there is neither public transportation nor even a sidewalk. They saw water damage resulting from roof leakage, exposed electrical wiring, and, and the shoddiest of construction. The Seabrook Apartments, which were purchased by Mr. Manafort and his partners for $4.4 million and then rehabilitated, will ultimately cost the American taxpayers well over $31 million in tax credits and rent subsidies. 
approximately 20% of the units are vacant. I mentioned earlier the game of Monopoly. Well, <clears throat> for well over $31 million, one would have expected at least Marvin Gardens. Unfortunately, we have here only a slum on Baltic or Mediterranean Avenue. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, um, in the interest of speeding the hearings along, we spent a great deal of time in going over many projects. Uh, I don't have uh, much of a comment, but I would like to say this. As the debacle at HUD unfolds, I still wish to keep in mind and to remind members of the committee that our principal goal is to rectify what really is a sad situation. And repeat what I said, I think proven beyond reasonable doubt, at least on the surface, that we have a system in HUD that lends itself to abuse and has done so for two decades. I'm not only concerned about Seabrook and New Jersey, I'm very concerned about today's hearing. But I'm also concerned about the fact that we have not yet apparently stemmed the tide at HUD in terms of procedures internally. It seems to me that the simplest and most effective way to assign responsibility is that when these projects have been granted, that someone along the way would have had to sign his name approving each project application step by step, whether it was the merits of the case, the financial uh, stability of the case, uh, the local acceptance of the case, or the acceptance and notification of the uh, hiring of a consultant. Nowhere in all the documents, and I mean hundreds of pages that we've studied, we see paperwork shunted from office to office rather than individual to individual. Now, we have memos and notes. We have no basic responsibility for the actions taken. And during the course of today's hearings, I want to zero in more and more on how each step of the process could be accomplished with so, apparently, so little review and so little authority behind each step. I am fascinated that we can have housing imposed upon a local unit without the local units initiating or acceding to the request. I would like that question addressed again as we did in prior testimony. It seems to me the basic need of so many communities, including communities in my own district, which I don't think has ever had a housing project that I'm aware of, um, that we just need to have a system that lends itself to inspection and to credible authorization and to the ultimate authority for a decision. So that when someone signs off and says, yes, I made that decision, I'm not at all ashamed of it, and the system works. We have here a system that simply does not work, and we need to look at each and every project, every step of the way. I join with the chairman uh, in his uh, rather critical review of the step-by-step -step process of how these projects were accomplished and hope that today we shed a little more light instead of so much heat. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. I don't have an opening statement. I'm ready to proceed. Congressman Shays. Congressman Morrison. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much again for your um, hospitality to uh, a member of the uh, Housing Subcommittee, the Banking Committee. Uh, I certainly look forward to the testimony today. The uh, uh, bulk of the Chairman's opening statement focused on the um, project in New Jersey, uh, but uh, as you know that uh, we're dealing uh, in with what some of our witnesses for people who have had substantial involvement in Connecticut, uh, and I look forward to the opportunity to explore some of uh, uh, the projects uh, in Connecticut with which uh, they've been involved and um, how that uh, links in with the various matters that this committee has been investigating. I certainly um, have a concern about the uh, whether we, in fact, now do have a complete accounting uh, of the involvement of the uh, uh, Black Manafort Stone and Kelly firm or its various subsidiaries and, and affiliated firms uh, with respect to consulting fees for HUD projects. And I hope to explore that as well. And I thank the chairman. Thank you very much. You gentlemen, please stand. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Please be seated. We will begin with you, Mr. Manafort, if that's agreeable to you. 
Um, before you begin your prepared statement, which will be entered into the record in its entirety, you may summarize it in any way you choose. At your last appearance, there were about 10 specific items on which you agreed to supply specific information to the subcommittee. To the best of my knowledge, this has not yet been supplied. And I am wondering, is it part of your prepared testimony, or are you going to supply this uh, sometime today? Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware of any items that haven't been supplied. When I submitted my letters, the staff didn't indicate that you know, we've communicated with them that there were any missing items. I'd be more than willing to supply the information if I just know what it is. Well, I, the chairman read your testimony over the weekend, and I will be happy to specify for you page by page items that you were unable to answer during your first appearance and you made a commitment to supply those items to the subcommittee after we will have taken care of some other items. I'll be happy to review those with you. I would appreciate that because if there's anything missing, it was purely inadvertent and uh, I wasn't notified that the committee was not satisfied with my submissions. So I apologize for that, <clears throat> but hopefully I'll be able to answer the questions. Very tonight. good. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my opening statement, I would like to review the record regarding Seabrook and our other HUD projects. In this regard, I think it will be helpful for me to restate for the record the full chronology of the relevant events regarding the Seabrook project. You should be aware that much of what I'm about to tell you has been related to me principally by either Mr. Victor Cruz or Mr. Lori Gay. Would you please pull the mic very close to you so we can all hear you much closer? Both of whom are here today and will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Cruz has advised me that sometime in August or September of 1986, Mr. Piera, a developer based in New London, Connecticut, called him and advised him about the Seabrook property. Following this discussion, Mr. Cruz talked with the owner of the property and subsequently visited the site. He also began to analyze the project, and as he indicated to me, he communicated with the New Jersey Housing Authority at that time. All of this occurred during September and October of 1986. Mr. Cruz has told me, to the best of his recollection, that he spoke with the technical staff at the New Jersey Division of Housing regarding this project. He has advised me that at the end of his preliminary due diligence, he came to the conclusion that the project was sufficiently merit-worthy to warrant further action. At that time, he and I discussed the project and concluded, among other things, that Black, Manafort, Stone, and Kelly should be involved in this matter. Subsequent to this discussion, I had a conversation regarding the project with one of the members of my firm, Mr. Gay. At that time, Mr. Gay already had a meeting scheduled with Ms. Dean on behalf of another client, the City of Camden. We decided that it would be appropriate for Mr. Gay to raise the Seabrook matter with Ms. Dean when he met with her to discuss the Camden matter. Mr. Gay reported to me that he met with Ms. Dean on the Camden matter on November 14, 1986. According to Mr. Gay, as the meeting was breaking up, he raised the Seabrook project with Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean asked whether the PHA had already submitted an application. Mr. Gay indicated that he did not know, but he would look into it. Ms. Dean then asked him if she could be sent a copy of that application. According to Mr. Gay, at no time did she make any representation to Mr. Gay that would suggest any kind of guarantee that the project would be funded. Mr. Gay later reported to me on his conversation with Ms. Dean. On November 19, 1986, Mr. Cruz and Mr. St Greg Stevens met with Mr. Ziegler of the New Jersey Division of Housing. Mr. Cruz advised me that during that meeting, he described our proposal with respect to the Seabrook property. As he reported to me, he indicated the units might be available for this project under the Secretary's discretionary fund and asked if the Division of Housing would be willing to submit an application. As Mr. Ziegler and Mr. Connolly have described in their testimony, the Division of Housing was already thoroughly familiar with the project and agreed that it was meritworthy. Based on their determination, the following day, November 20, 1986, the Division of Housing submitted its application for 326 mod rehab units to, the, to HUD. On April 9, 1987, a joint venture was formally concluded between CFM, the development company of which I am a partner, and CDC, the financial arm of the project. I would like to observe at several points in my previous testimony, members of the subcommittee mistakenly assumed that this was the date on which we purchased the property. That is not correct. The property was not purchased until the end of October, almost five months after the units were awarded to the project. At what point did you take an option on the property, Mr. Manafort? 
uh, there were several options on the property, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first, the first one, I believe, was February 24, and that expired on April 1. And what happened at that uh, point? At that point, an, an extension was given while we were negotiating with the, uh, the seller, uh, and the, an April 9th uh, uh, contract was signed with a liquidated damages clause that would have allowed us to walk away from the deal for only the earnest money that had been put down. So for all practical purposes, while you didn't have to dish out the money for the purchase, you had control of the property by virtue of your option during this entire period that through Ms. Dean's efforts, uh, the units were awarded. Is that correct? We had, we had uh, control of the property for 90 days pursuant to that agreement, sir. Um, but at no time during Which that period... Which 90 days are you talking 90 about? 90 days from April 9. The agreement was for approximately 90 days. The, and would Can you expire. supply the subcommittee with the agreement? I, I will get a copy of it for you, yes, sir. Um, when were the units awarded? The units were awarded on June 1st on a conditional award from the PHA to us. They were awarded from HUD to the PHA in a letter dated April 24. So you extended your option, you are testifying early in April, and on April 24 the units were awarded. That is correct. So on April 24 you knew that you received this, what amounts to $31 million in rent subsidies and the tax credits. So before you made the purchase, you had the assurance of this enormously valuable public subsidy. Is that correct? Uh, no, sir. Well, then explain to me why you are answering no, sir. We did not have what I would consider to be the assurance sufficient to close the deal on April 24th. On April 24th, what was happening was the PHA was receiving program funding from HUD. They still had to go through an advertisement process, which I know we're going to speak about this morning. I'm prepared to we surely this will, Mr. Manafort. And I, am, I, I, I need to remind you that you are under oath. We have had a very, very unsatisfactory dialogue between you and, I think, most members of the subcommittee on the question of your repeated statement that you were at risk. You will have to explain that risk to the subcommittee because at the moment, at least the chairman of the subcommittee is incapable of comprehending what risk we are talking about. So please proceed. And I just want to have the record show that you had control of the property by virtue of your option. And you purchased the property after the units were awarded not to the state of New Jersey, but to this property. Is that correct? Can you repeat that, sir? I'll be happy to. By virtue of your option, you had control of the property. You, in fact, purchased the property after the units had been awarded, not for use in New Jersey at any project that the Public Housing Authority deemed most meritorious, but for this particular project. It was a tailor-made award for this set of units. And when this award was made, you proceeded to purchase these units. Is that correct? Oh, yes, we purchased it when the award was made. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, yes, I can't sir. We, we purchased Please the pull the mic closer to you. We did purchase the property uh, after, the, after the units were awarded. Yes, I agree with that. Then I have failed, then I fail to see the risk that you keep referring to, both in your previous testimony and apparently now. Explain the risk. The risk that I keep referring to, sir, on April 9th, for example, we couldn't have purchased the property if we wanted to. Uh, we didn't have our financing lined up, and there was no way, as I've testified before, that this project could carry a conventional financing package. Uh, so the units and the subsidy were a critical component to being able to close the project. Uh, until the now units were awarded... Point, it's sort of self-evident that if you don't have your financing in order, then you cannot purchase a property. We all understand that. You diligently pursued the matter of obtaining financing. Once you got your financing, you purchased the project. 
That is correct, sir. What was your risk at that point? Once we got Since you knew that the units were awarded before the Public Housing Authority knew that the units were awarded, and you knew that the units were awarded for this particular project. Well, once we got the financing, sir, there was no risk any longer. Well, in your earlier testimony, you kept referring to the risk not in terms of your working on the financing, but in terms of somebody else getting these units. Well, you're, you're testifying today, please correct me if I'm wrong, you are testifying today that there was no risk whatever, as far as you were concerned, of another developer getting these 326 units since they were tailor-made for this project on which first you had an option and subsequently you purchased. N n sir, as Mr. Cruz can talk about in a little while, there was another application that could have been made for that project and we were aware of it and certainly during the advertising phase of the PHA, we felt at risk about it. Uh, so, I mean, if, if you want to talk, ask Mr. Cruz who had no, first No, I'm asking knowledge. you now. I will ask Mr. Cruz when it's his turn to testify. I'm asking you now, what risk did you feel when in fact the units were awarded for this particular apartment project on which first you had an option and then you purchased it? Uh, in hindsight, sir, looking at the transcript, it appears that you would think that we had felt no risk. In fact, during the whole procedure, we felt first until the units hit the PHA. I'm not that asking you about your feelings, well, but, Manifold, you're but feelings are not objectively ascertainable. You I mean, I am asking you as a, as a man of great attainment and achievement and obviously great intelligence, that in a business transaction, if everything is nailed down, if everything is nailed down, short of a natural disaster such as a tornado or a hurricane, what kind of risk did you fear? Let me, if I may just finish the answer, sir, there are several risks that we felt. First, and, th and as of April 9th, which is, assu I assume, the date you're asking me? No, I'm asking you during this whole period. Well, until the very end, on no, October 26th, we felt risk about a variety of things. Number one, the financing. Number two, When did you resolve the financing? Uh, I believe it was uh, right contemporaneous with our purchasing of the property on October 26th. So you, were, you were not sure at all during this whole period that you would get financing for what looks like a, a sort of license to make money. I mean, the, what, what were your the, anxieties about the financing? Sir, until we had a signed AHAP, which happened on October 8th, we had nothing that a financial institution would b base any financing on. So until October 8th, we were not able to seriously negotiate, although of course we had much negotiations, to conclude a financing package. It was not until between October 8th and October 26th when we purchased the property that we were able to conclude the financial package. Secondly, and we were well aware of this and you've seen it just in the course of the, this committee's deliberations, HUD could have frozen the units at any time notwithstanding any award that not had been given. Not under Sam Pierce they weren't well, freezing but, units, they were freezing units under Jack Kemp. Well, but we felt an exposure on that and you asked me where did we feel exposure. We felt did an exposure. Did you have any indication that Pierce or Deborah Dean will freeze the awarding of units uh, during these negotiations? No, sir, but as a prudent did businessman... Did they freeze the, the awarding of units at any time during the eight years of Sam Pierce's tenure? Uh, I can't answer that question, sir. I don't know. I can tell you, at no time did they freeze the awarding of units. But I can tell you, sir, as a prudent businessman, until those units were conditionally awarded, and even after that, on, on June 1, we felt at risk that the units just were not a part of that project, just as, frankly, uh, on April 1, when our, first op when our option agreement was expiring, we felt at risk that the se seller might not want to sell the project. And he held us up. He was a very tough negotiator, and the agreement that we concluded on April 9th was a result of heavy negotiations. Mr. So Manafort, I am dealing with the awarding of the units to this project. You are correct in saying that the seller could have changed his mind. That's not a risk. The risk you, f the, the only reasonable definition of the term risk is that you buy this dilapidated bunch of barracks and then you don't get the rehab units then you don't get funding from HUD that's the only risk we are talking about sir we could have had the rehab units applied and not been able to get our financing in which case the whole deal would have fallen apart even though we had the units 
that was a real risk to us. Well, no, it wasn't a risk, because if you didn't get the funding, you wouldn't have bought it, and you wouldn't have risked a dime of your money except whatever little earnest money you put down. Isn't that correct? If we, if we didn't get the funding, we wouldn't have been able to do the deal. That's you, right. And, and what I'm saying to you is until October 8th, we were not able to move towards conclusion on any funding package, and that was a serious business risk as we perceived it. Additionally, sir, and, and you've heard some testimony to this effect by, uh, by the mayor and by Mr. Connolly, when we did start negotiating with the city, and Mr. Cruz can speak much in, to much more detail on this, and the city building code was changing, that was affecting the rehab program and the feasibility of that rehab program, and that presented a risk as well, because that could have, we could have been unable to conclude a rehabilitation program with the local community, in which case the whole deal would have fallen apart again, even though the units were there. So there were risks attendant throughout the whole process, and as you've heard some testimony uh, from Mr. Conley, even after we closed the deal and even after we did the rehab, there was some risk attained. So you, you asked why did we feel risk. There were a number of business reasons why we felt risk that, that tracked throughout the whole negotiation and the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, process of planning and closing on the property. On October 26th, when we bought the property and title transferred, that's when we felt as if we were in control of the situation in a more secure way. Ms. Manafort, on June 20th, uh, you were asked the following question. Do you agree that the advertising was sort of a sham? Mr. Manafort, the advertising was putting us at risk. Are you still maintaining that, that the yes. advertising put you at risk? Yes, sir. And, and we're, I'm prepared to tell you why. I mean, I'm not trying to avoid the question. Well, Mr. Connolly, the Director of Housing for the State of New York, told the subcommittee that the advertising was an absolute sham. Well, I have about four points I'd like to address to that, if I may. First, we didn't write the ad. I'm sorry? First, we didn't write the ad. Second, the, the procedure in which the ad was placed and the language of the ad, according to Mr. Connolly's testimony, was standard procedure and standard operating language. The advertisement was not written for our project. In fact, I believe Mr. Connolly testifies that the same ad was used for the Trenton project and was used in other projects as well. So the fact that our project fit the criteria of that ad is not an indication that we wrote the ad, but it is an indication that our project fit the threshold requirements of a housing project. Mr. But Manafort, beyond that, Mr. Manafort, no one is suggesting you wrote the ad. You are, you are making the statement that the advertising fit your project. That was your statement, isn't it? I am saying that our project fit the advertising. That's correct. Was there any other project that fit that advertising? To the best of our knowledge, yes. Tell me what other project uh, in uh, Deerfield had 326 units no, that fit the advertising. The, the advertisement, sir, and Mr. Cruz again can speak more directly to it. The advertisement said for project units in, in, uh, of 100 or more lot. The person who sold us this project, and we were well aware of this, had other units, uh, and I believe it was a 135 unit project in the same town, in the same site, that, his, that had the same criteria because it was in the same condition, it was the same owner. Uh, and he could have submitted an application, and, and obviously he was aware that we were proceeding with something because we were buying the 326 units from him. So we felt at risk at that time that he could put an application in and would have met all the criteria of the advertisement of being in Seabrook, being in, uh, having 100 units or more, uh, being, uh, requiring extensive rehabilitation, uh, and, and all the other HUD requirements. That was a risk to us, sir. Mm -hmm. why, didn't he, why didn't he apply? I cannot answer that question, sir. Did you ever discuss it with him? Uh, not to the best of my knowledge. Did any of your associates? Not to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, Congressman Shade. I've tried to... Um reevaluate how I ask questions in this committee over the weekend and I really wanted to come to this hearing with a totally open mind about about the facts as it relates to uh, Seabrook and other things that Black Manafort Stone and Kelly may be involved in but I've been listening to this dialogue and I I am someone who's confused and I don't want to go on until I just resolve your definition of risk if you're saying to us that the project was at risk that it was never a certainty until you had the, um, the financing, until you had the rent subsidies, because you needed all of that to make it work. 
then, then you're saying something uh, that I can agree with. But if you're saying to us that you put yourself financially at significant risk, um, then I have a bit of a question. Because I guess my point is, it's true that you had an option to buy the project, correct? Y yes, sir. Yeah, okay. And it's also true that an option means that you don't have to buy the project. Is that not also true? That is correct, okay. sir. The real question isn't whether you physically own the project. The real question is when um, or not after. The real question is, were you able to find out beforehand that you would get the rent subsidies before you made that final commitment, which would be a risk, to buy them? And that's the, the answer I'd like to know. Did you basically have the rent subsidies in line before you transferred the project to, to yourself? To uh, absolutely. We, we could not purchase the property without the subsidy being applied to the okay, property. Well, I think so. that's important. But so what you're saying to us, though, is you didn't put yourself on the line to buy this project until you had the rent, uh, rent subsidies and tax credits. But you had an advantage that someone else didn't have. You had the option to purchase that project. Isn't that correct? We had the option to purchase a project. Yes, sir. So I'll just tell you what I'm getting from this. What I'm getting is that it wasn't a done deal until you had the rent subsidies. And I agree with you, because you, you'd be a fool to buy the project without the rent subsidies. So the project was at risk, but you financially were not at risk. We, we were at risk for the earnest money we put down, sir. How much was that? Uh, on April 9th, it was $450,000, 10% of the deal. Uh, when did you first get the option to buy it? April 1st? Is that when the... No, sir. The, the option that led... On February 24th, we had an option to purchase the property based on a certain contingencies, and that related to an agreement that was signed in early January, which tied up the property uh, for 30 days. Um, on that, that... And this is the coincidence of dates, but the point is that option agreement expired on April 1. Okay. So at, on April 1, we either had to sign another agreement or we lost, uh, lost control of the property. Okay. That April 1 expiration date led into an April 9th contract that provided us with the ability to walk away from the deal at any time for only the 10% deposit that we put down. Was that refundable? No, sir. That was the risk. At no time could you have, at no time could you have, uh, under no circumstances, could you have uh, uh, gotten that paid back to you? No, Is that your testimony? The seller was, bro, drove a very difficult bargain, and we had to make a business decision at that point to put at risk $450,000 uh, for the joint venture. And that was our risk from then until we closed the project. And under no circumstances could that have been refunded to you? That's your testimony. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that is correct, sir, as I understand the contract. M Mr. Manafort, I just... The, eight, the April 9th one, sir. I mean, that's, what I, that's where we put the, the four... We put actually... A, a, on April 9th, we put $425,000 down, which in addition to the previous money that could have been refunded to us, approximately $25,000, maximized our exposure at $450,000, which was approximately 10% of the deal, uh, which is a traditional uh, down payment in a real estate deal. We wanted to have the options to walk away from the deal, uh, but the seller refused to budge on that, and during the negotiations, we ended up putting in a liquidated damages clause such that on any, under any circumstances, we could walk away from that point forward. May I just pursue this? Um, so from February to April, you had an option to buy, but did not have to put earnest money down. There was earnest money of approximately $25,000, Congressman, but it was refundable. But from April on, um, clearly, uh, under your testimony, you are at risk. Uh, one, if you don't get the rent subsidies, the project is dead. I mean, you can't finance it. Or two, uh, if you don't get financing. Did you have financing by April 1st? No, sir. Okay. Now, that fits my definition of being at risk from that point on. Now, it is your testimony, I want to be a little more specific, that even if you didn't get the financing, you still would have been out the $400,000? If we couldn't close the deal, sir, we lost the money. What, let me just make it, but if you couldn't get, yeah, okay, so in other words, if you can't get financing, you're going to have a hard time. Close so your it. testimony would be that if you couldn't get financing <coughs> or the rent subsidy, then you were out $400,000. Or work out the rehabilitation plan with the city where they would provide us building permits. Okay. So then, the, then what we have to decide, because every business transaction has a risk, uh, and, we, and, and businessmen and women want to, to limit their risk as best as possible. 
then we have to decide from that moment, April 1st on, what real risk you took. It may have been substantive, may not have been, but this, this at least helps me. You had to get your financing, you had to get your rent subsidies and the tax credits both. You had to work out with the city uh, exactly whether or not you could the have rehabilitation a rehabilitation plan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So, so I summarize the salient point here, because I think it's very important. You put down the $425,000 after you knew that the units were awarded. Is that correct? We, uh, yes, sir. In fact, we received a letter from the PHA on approximately March 30th, which indicated that they were pleased with the feasibility of the package that we had provided and indicated to us, and I can quote and I can provide a copy of the letter to the committee, uh, it said, quote, I anticipate, dear Mr. Cruz, the application on the above noted property, which was submitted to the Section 8 Mod Rehab Program, has been reviewed by the appropriate staff. The project is indeed feasible and is eligible for inclusion in the Moderate Rehab Program. I anticipate an award of Moderate Rehab units from HUD for Seabrook within 60 days. Upon satisfaction of the mandatory HUD requirements, I believe a formal commitment of units can be made to your project. I stress can. I feel confident that we can enter into an agreement to enter into a housing assistance contract by June 1, 1986. That, in fact, did not happen until 87. October uh, 87. That, in fact, did not happen until October 8. Uh, should you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. So we had some notice that our project was feasible, and we had some notice that upon satisfaction of the mandatory requirements, uh, we could uh, be funded from the, uh, from the program. Go ahead, Mr. On April 24, 1987, HUD sent written notice of <coughs> approval of program funding to the New Jersey House Division of Housing. According to Mr. Connolly's testimony, this notice was received on May 1st. In early May 1987, after the award to the PHA, but prior to the award of the specific Seabrook project, I am told by CDC that the joint venture had its first contact with local officials in Upper Deerfield. This contact was made by the architect for the joint venture, Mr. Myron Hackett, who contacted the Upper Deerfield Building Inspector, a Mr. Froelich, to obtain code information regarding rehabilitation of the Seabrook project. On May 18, 1987, the New Jersey Division of Housing published its advertisement in the Millville Daily. Two weeks later, on June 1, 1987, the Housing Division granted a conditional award to the joint venture. The joint venture still had an option to purchase the property, but it had not yet done so. On September 8, 1987, the joint venture received and signed the proposed agreement with the housing division to enter into a housing assistance payments contract. The housing division executed the contract on October 8, 1987. Closing on the project was held approximately two weeks later on October 26, 1987, at which time the property was purchased and the title transferred to the joint venture. The joint venture began rehabilitation on the project on November 30. We expect to complete the project later this year. In my previous testimony, I had indicated that asbestos had been discovered in this project. In response to a question from Congressman Weiss, I indicated that I believe the asbestos was discovered after rehabilitation had begun on the project. Congressman Weiss asked me to check on this, and in response, I wrote to CDC immediately following the hearing, asking them to confirm the date of discovery. CDC wrote back indicating the asbestos was discovered on or about December 16, 1987, and I conveyed this information to the chairman in my letter of July 11, 1989. However, it has come to my attention from CDC in the past few days that the joint venture discovered the possibility of asbestos in ceiling tiles in a certain area of each unit in May 1987, approximately. These suspect tiles were in, air, in an area approximately five feet by six feet above the furnaces in each unit. In the opinion of the contractors who inspected the units, the removal of this asbestos was expected to be relatively insignificant in terms of time and expense. The first discovery of asbestos, which did pose a major problem in terms of expense and delay, in which I was referring to in my testimony, came in December of 1987, when demolition was t taking place in the first units, as I reported in my July 11 letter. I hope this helps to put the events surrounding the Seabrook project into perspective. Before I conclude my opening statement, I would like to make the following additional points. First, at the time our development project entered into the Seabrook uh, development company, entered into the Seabrook project, we felt that it was merit-worthy. We continue to believe this today. 
Indeed, our confidence in the project has been borne out by the testimony of the New Jersey Director of Public Housing, Mr. William Conley, who indicated, quote, by our ordinary competitive standards, it was a good project. It was large. It was in an area of substantial housing need. It was a project that required little relocation. It was the major low-income housing resource in that particular area. And it was clear that without some sort of intervention, that resource was going to be lost, unquote. Ms. Manafort, what yes, is the vacancy rate according to your figures? The vacancy rate, well, we're in construction right now, sir, um, as well, I am led to believe. With respect to the completed units. As I'm led to believe, sir, there is a waiting list, and it's just a matter of dealing with, see, we don't control. That's not true. Mr. Cruz may have better information than I do, sir. Mr. Cruz, you want to help us? Is there a vacancy factor at the project now? There certainly is, Mr. Chairman. Approximately what percentage, sir? I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but... Uh, we were told it's about 20 percent. Would that correspond with your information? I don't have any specific information on vacancies, uh, Mr. Chairman. I could tell you, based upon my own personal knowledge, is what's the vacancy situation is like, though, if you will. Please. We are presently in construction, and we've completed almost uh, 80 percent of the project. In order to uh, have tenants uh, occupy the units, we have to receive a certificate of occupancy from the, uh, the building inspector and the housing code official. Uh, to this time, uh, I, I'm s pretty certain that we have 166 units occupied, but we have almost uh, the entire project ready for occupancy, but we have not received the certificates of occupancies from the construction official and the housing code enforcement officer. They have been holding those up. For what reason, may I ask? Uh, we have been in negotiations with the town for some time and even the occupancy that we have have been deemed a temporary certificate of occupancy because the town is concerned about and has been concerned from day one about gutters and downspouts, uh, gutters and downspouts that lead water away from, the, uh, from the, the buildings themselves. They have also been concerned about a laundromat. Uh, they want uh, the people uh, to have a laundromat on site as indicated by uh, your reference to the fact that they have to go a half a mile uh, to a laundromat and they're also concerned about the site itself. The site uh, uh, needs some work, and the town wants to be assured that if they grant us uh, COs, that, they would, uh, that we would complete the site work that we've been negotiating with them on. Uh, so, Mr. Cruz, your testimony is that as of now, you don't have a single permanent certificate of occupancy? That's correct. The town has not given us Not any one single permanent certificate of occupancy. The town has the power to grant permanent certificates of occupancy. I understand. And you have not yet been granted a single one of those. Is that correct? The town has not given us any permanent certificates of occupancy. You are suggesting that you have 160 temporary certificates of occupancy. Is that well, right? Well, uh, the number uh, is actually 182 temporary Hun 182. certificates of occupancy. 182. Right. Now, of those 182, are there any that are vacant? Uh, I don't have any specific no. knowledge that there are any vacant of the 182. And how many units are there that, in your judgment, are completed, but according to your statement a minute ago, the town is unwilling to give you even temporary certificates of occupancy, and why? The standard, the, the first 182 units, uh, Mr. Chairman, were granted temporary certificates of occupancy subjects to gutters and downspouts. Right. Uh, what we did was we agreed with the town that we would provide gutters and downspouts at the end of the construction process so that once the 326 units were at, had all been rehabbed internally, we would then have our construction people go and do all 326 units to gutters and downspouts. What I was told, what well, I what think What happens of, if there are big rains between now and then and there are no gutters? Uh, well, what do the people do who live in the 182 units without gutters? That's a very good uh, question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. For 
all the time prior to our, our arrival, there weren't any gutters and downspouts, Mr. Chairman. I think that is but what- But there also wasn't a $31 million rent subsidy That's and correct. tax breaks. That's correct. We agreed with the town that there should be gutters and downspouts. We, we definitely agreed with them. We thought the timing would be better if we did it at the completion For of For whom would it be better? For it would the be occupants? Better, it would be better for the occupants and the site also. Because Why would it be better for the occupants to live without gutters? Explain that to me. Well, I don't think it would be better for them to live without gutters and downspouts. What I believe is because we had so many construction people on the site who were tracking mud and the whole rehab process is such a messy process that it would be better in effect for the, for the completed site to have the gutters and downspouts put on at one time. However, the town has decided at least this is the information that I have been provided, that because we are nearing the end and the completion of this construction, because the town, its mayor, its building inspector, its housing code enforcement officer, are not certain about what controls they would have on us after the construction was completed, that they wanted to negotiate these portions of uh, site laundry mat and gutters and downspouts before we completed construction. And so uh, I understand that. Uh, Ms. Manafort, yes, one of the families living in the unit, the Sanchez family, been living there for two months, they have had their ceiling collapse from water leaks. They're paying $557 a month. Are you aware of that? Uh, yes, sir, I am. And uh, I believe it was above the closet. And, uh, and I believe what uh, they, they were, I know what they were told by us was, according to, Mr. According, according to our project manager, that we would make restitution uh, for any damage that was done. And it was, uh, the, the damage I should mention, sir, was done as a result of the heavy rainstorms over the last week. And we have agreed to make the changes. We have agreed to, uh, if this is the, the family that uh, I am told that you visited, uh, we, and this was before you had visited them, sir. Uh, we had already met with them and, and agreed that we would make the, cha the changes. Uh, the point, I guess, that needs to be made here is we're in the middle of a construction project. And, uh, and construction projects, as Mr. Cruz has said, are messy. Uh, but when we're finished with the project, as I indicated uh, in my last testimony, we believe the tenants will be very happy and the survey that I referred to in my last testimony of the completed units at that point showed that they were very happy, showed that they felt that, uh, that the project had been considerably improved and that the management of the project was, uh, was, was very good. Now, there are going to be situations in any project, and certainly one of 326 units, where there are going to be problems. We're committed to correcting them, and we will. But going back to your question, sir, as to the vacancy, the vacancy, as Mr. Cruz has said, is related directly to the certificates of occupancy. I am led to believe uh, that, uh, that there is a long waiting list at the Bureau of Public Housing for these units. In fact, the publicity that is generated from this, this committee, I am told, has generated a lot of inquiries about living in the, uh, in the apartments. So the vacant, we are very confident and comfortable in feeling that when the project is completed and when the certificates of occupancy are issued, that all of the units will be filled and there'll still be a waiting list. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Second, in all matters, BMSK has worked within the existing system at HUD. We played by the, the rules. I understand that the committee, subcommittee views the process as fundamentally flawed. I am not here to argue with the subcommittee about the process or to defend it or to engage in a debate about whether decision making on low and moderate income housing should rest at the local level or whether part of it should be consolidated in Washington. I do, however, want to make be sure that you have a full and accurate picture of the way in which BMSK operated within the system to assist in your deliberations. Finally, let me explain why it took my follow-up correspondence of July 18 to identify the HUD projects with which BMSK and, and, and I have been involved for a fee. As you will recall during my June 20 testimony, you asked me to identify our other HUD projects. Given that the focus of that hearing was Seabrook, I had dedicated most of my preparation to reviewing that project. Following the hearing, I frankly focused on, uh, on the HUD projects which my colleagues and I had undertaken in connection with BMSK, not with our predecessor organization or affiliated companies. We thoroughly reviewed BMSK financial records and submitted the results to the subcommittee in my July 11 letter. The day after I submitted the letter, the New York Times contact, 
contacted us concerning a project in Waterbury, Connecticut, in which we received fees in an affiliated company. This inquiry caused us to be concerned about still other projects that may not have been previously reported. Our company had expanded and was reorganized into a new company, Black Manafort, Stone & Kelly, in December 1984. In preparing the original list of HUD projects, we did not delve into the stored records of our predecessor company, Black Manafort Stone, or any of the affiliated companies. As a result of this press inquiry, we retrieved from storage and undertook a thorough review of the existing records of Black Manafort Stone and all our affiliated companies back to their inception to ensure that we had discovered all HUD clients of any of them. In my absence, one of my partners wrote to you on July 13 indicating our commitment to conduct a broader review, including not only the records of BMSK, but also the records of previous and related organizations going back to 1980, as well as a more extensive review of my personal records. I flew back from an overseas business trip the next morning to assist in this process, and my colleagues and I worked through the weekend to complete this task. As a result of this review, we identified additional HUD projects which we submitted in my letter dated July 18, 1989. To the best of my knowledge, we have now identified to the subcommittee each of the HUD-related projects undertaken by BMSK, BMS, the related organizations, and myself on behalf of our clients. Finally, let me point out that many of the clients we have disclosed are clients for whom work at HUD is a very small part of our service. Most of my firm's clients are general retainer clients for whom we work on a wide range of issues throughout the federal government, both the Congress and the executive branch. For some of them, an occasional project requiring HUD work has arisen, and each of those has been disclosed. General, sir, that concludes my opening statement, and I'm prepared to answer any other questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Manafort. <clears throat> Could you outline for us your business, social, other relationships with uh, Deborah Dean? I have no business relationship with uh, Deborah Dean, sir. You never had any? A social relationship with her. I would see her occasionally at uh, political functions in town, things like that. Is that what you're referring to in your question? Well, would you consider her 30th birthday party as a political function? No, no I, there, there are two occasions that I, that I guess could be deemed non-political functions. One was her birthday party, I'm where I, w although some people may say that was a political function, uh, where I attended. How did you view it, as a political function or a social function? I viewed it as a social function, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one occasion where I joined uh, Mr. Gay and Mr. Uh, uh, Cartwright of, of my firm in having dinner with Ms. Dean in sometime in, uh, when was it? It was in, it was in 1988, I believe. September of 1987. No. September of 1987. Those are the only two occasions outside of what I would view as normal political functions where I b can recollect being with her. I'm sending you copies of two memoranda, Ms. Manafort, to Ms. Dean from a Mr. James Bow, General Deputy Assistant Secretary, and John Mooring, Special Assistant to the Undersecretary. Let's first deal with Mr. Mooring's memo. I'll give you time to read it. In essence, uh, this is a memorandum uh, to Deborah Dean from Mr. John Mooring, Special Assistant to the Undersecretary, dated September 16, 1986. Ms. Dean refers an outline proposal for privatization of a troubled public housing project in Bridgeport, Connecticut, to John Mooring, Special Assistant to the Undersecretary, for comment on September 5, 1986. His note to Ms. Dean, dated September 16, 86, indicates that she also instructed him to send a letter to the Connecticut Housing Authority with a copy to Paul Manafort. The significance of this document is that it indicates that uh, you have a direct line to HUD. 
You are receiving copies of low-income development proposals at a very early stage of consideration, which would give you an enormous competitive advantage over other consultants. You are not listed in this document as having any connection whatsoever with this project. There would be no apparent reason that Ms. Dean should send you a copy. Um, by 1986, uh, six, this project becomes the largest federal housing construction project undertaken in Connecticut in a decade. It is described by one state official as a monster because of the fraudulent contracts and the escalating costs. Now, I find the cover of the memo intriguing, and I'd like to ask you to comment on the memo as a whole, as well as the cover. Cover is from Mr. Mooring, Special Assistant to the Under Secretary, September 1686, to Deborah. When you returned my memo on the Beardsley Terrace proposal, you said that I should prepare a letter to them from you with a copy to Paul Manafort. I'd be happy to do so, but I'm not quite sure what you want put in the letter, John. And uh, Miss Dean's note is to John Mooring, I want you to amass great wells of power and wield it on my behalf. Uh, can you explain first uh, why you were sent a copy of this? I, I don't Secondly, know. Secondly, what the, what the rationale is, by the way, a mess I think is misspelled, but that is not <laughs> our concern. Um, uh, yeah, yes, sir, let me put that. Please. This, this, uh, this was not a project of a client of Black Manafort, Stone & Kelly. I want to put this into perspective for you. The first time I met Mr. Cruz... Could you please pull the mic as close as mine is to me, please? The first time I met Mr. Cruz, he asked me about... He had inquired uh, through, uh, through my father uh, to ask me about HUD's privatization program. And frankly, sir, I didn't know anything about HUD's privatization program. Uh, and he indic indicated that he, on his own, this was before CFM was created, although it led, it, you know, we developed a personal relationship from this episode, uh, was interested in pursuing the po prospect, the possibility of privatizing this Beardsley Terrace project and asked me if I might be able to inquire as to the policy. We inquired into the policy. Uh, in fact, uh, w the only time I recall ever meeting with Ms. Dean uh, uh, was when I set up a meeting for Mr. Cruz and Ms. Dean in Ms. Dean's office to introduce them so that she could explain the policy. This, is, this doesn't deal with policy. This deals well, with a specific project. Let, let me, the point is, but my interest related to just getting the two of them together, she didn't, un, she didn't really understand the policy, she said, and would set up meeting for Mr. Cruz with the appropriate people. He then had subsequent meetings at the, uh, uh, within HUD that he could speak to better than I. We'll, uh, we will ask him. Uh, and uh, as far as this memo is concerned, I don't recall uh, you know, obviously, I, I don't recall seeing the, uh, the cover page, and I don't recall, uh, although this looks like it was uh, Mr. Mr. Cruz's proposal uh, that was ultimately sometimes submitted, uh, I don't recall the specifics of the proposal either. But this was something where, as a friend, we were uh, inquiring and, and helping Mr. Cruz into the system because it was a very complex issue, which ultimately, uh, I believe, as Mr. Cruz will testify, caused him not to even pursue it. I understand that, Ms. Manafort, but that's really not my question. My question is an entirely different one. HUD deals with countless consultants and countless developers. You're the only one who, according to Ms. Dean, should get a copy of this correspondence, these internal documents. Well. I, I mean, I can't answer that as to why... Uh, Can you speculate as to why you should be the only outside entity to obtain an internal HUD document? Well, I don't know what internal HUD documents we're talking about, sir. Uh, so I can't speculate. <coughs> well, let I me mean, read the memo cover letter to you again. And, and yeah. I, I, I think you understand very clearly what I'm saying. Are, are you I, am looking, I am looking at a memo on official HUD stationery to Deborah Dean from John A. Mooring, Special Assistant to the Undersecretary of HUD. 
And the memo reads as follows. To Deborah, when you returned my memo on the Beardsley Terrace proposal, you said that I should prepare a letter to them from you with a copy to Paul Manafort. I'd be happy to do so, but I'm not quite sure what you want put in the letter. <coughs> Signed, John. And she responds to him. I, I suspect JM stands for John Mooring. I want you to amass great wells of power and wield it on my behalf. S sir, the attachment Mr. Cruz just told me is his proposal. Well, it's his proposal. It's not your proposal. That's right. I mean, uh, the document cover letter is attached to what Mr. Cruz just told me was his proposal. So I don't understand why you're saying this is an internal HUD document. Uh, this is an internal HUD document. No, this, this is, is his the proposal. Mem the memo. Well, yeah, but you just gave this to me. I, I didn't have this memorandum, sir. You just gave this to me. I I'm confused as the question. The, the Maureen memorandum is attached to a proposal that Mr. Cruz just told me was his proposal, not an internal HUD document. But as to what he's referring to here, or she's referring to, I don't know what the letter is, and I don't recall receiving it. Well, what Miss Dean says is that a letter should go back to the originators of the proposal. You are not one of the originators, is no, that sir. correct? That is correct. But she says you should get a copy of that letter. Well, I don't recall receiving the copy, sir, but and, and I, you know, I don't choose to speculate because there could have been a variety of reasons, but I do acknowledge that I was the one who put Mr. Cruz into the system so that he could find out what the policy was. Let me move on to the second memo. By the way, would you care to comment on the amassing of great wells of power and wielding it on her behalf? No, sir. What's your judgment about this? Uh, I have no judgment on it. You have no judgment on this. Okay, let's move on to the second memo. This is to Deborah Dean. By the way, the second memo consists of a cover note and uh, seven, seven single-spaced uh, pages of a document. Would you agree, Mr. Manafort, that this is an internal hot document? Uh, yes, it is, sir. It is an internal HUD document. Were you at the time this letter was uh, prepared part of HUD? Uh, no, sir. No, I've never been a part of HUD. You have never been part of HUD. Now let me read the cover letter. Cover letter is from James E. Bow, General Deputy Assistant Secretary, 103086, to Deborah Dean. This is the write-up on Bridgeport, Connecticut privatization proposal projects, I suspect Connecticut 45, 2, 4, and 7. You may wish to forward a copy to Paul Manafort. After reviewing, if you have any questions, please call me. And she sends it out on to you, Paul Manafort, FYI, D, I take it, that means Deborah, on October 5. Does this reflect a sharing with you of an internal HUD document? First of all, sir, I don't recall ever receiving this document. Well, I'm not asking you whether you recall receiving it. I presume that this was not a manufactured document. This is a document that comes from HUD files. Yes. So let's, let's leave it aside whether you recall or do not recall. You will search your files and you'll find whether it's there or it's not there. Yes, sir. <coughs> What is your comment, Ms. Manafort, about your receiving an internal HUD document? Well, first of all, as I said, sir, I don't recall receiving it. Uh, secondly, I, as I said, I introduced Mr. Cruz into the process, and he was meeting with people at HUD openly. There was nothing secret going on. And I have not read this memorandum, but it looks like it's a response to the proposal, which is the document attached to the first, which was his proposal, which was a... Uh, it, which was a pro uh, but this is not his proposal. This is HUD's evaluation of his proposal. Well, but it would make sense that they would talk to Mr. Cruz about their evaluation of his proposal. They're sending this to you. Well, I don't recall receiving it, sir. But the point is, you asked me to characterize what it would represent. And what I would say is it would represent is he sat with HUD on his own initiative to talk about a privatization program, and he ultimately developed a proposal. And this memorandum deals with the results of those meetings.
Did you have any involvement in this project? No, sir. Then why should you receive the HUD internal document relating to this project? Because Deborah Dean, if she were to send these to me, would not know who Victor Cruz was, even though I introduced her to him, and she ultimately put him in touch with people within the department. Mr. Manafort, will you describe for the subcommittee your business and social relationship with Hunter Cushing? Sir, I don't recall that I've ever met Hunter Cushing. Mm -hmm. So you have no relationship? Uh, not that I know. Congressman Lukens. First of all, let me um, commend you. I think that you have at least made an honest effort now, after, uh, I suppose, three encounters or, or conferences with our staff and with members to go through every record of all the companies and corporations with which you have been associated and hopefully gleaned 100% of all the contacts and contracts that any of your subordinate companies or your present employer or company of which you're part owner have had contacts with HUD. You think you have all of the possible uh, to the best of my knowledge. business connections listed in your testimony? best of my knowledge, as I say in my statement, Congressman, we have analyzed all the files, and I believe that every client that we have, we have disclosed to this firm. I'd like to go back over a, uh, an issue that I think the Chairman has rightfully raised, because I was the first one to raise it about a month ago, on internal document exposure. And I think there's some confusion yet about the testimony uh, that you've given and the situation surrounding these two memos, which I'm seeing for the first time. The first memo, September 16th, from John to Debbie, Deborah Dean, and then the uh, written response from Deborah about the wells of power. You're saying that this is, to your knowledge, not an internal document. Is that correct, or am I misreading your testimony? The, the cover letter is certainly an internal document, Congressman. What I'm saying is Mr. Cruz has just told me that the attachment is his proposal. Thank you. So the attachment was written, prepared by Mr. Cruz. Is that correct, Mr. If I might uh, move to Mr. Cruz. Is that correct, Mr. Cruz? That is correct, uh, Congressman. Thank you. Now. So this proposal was given by you to whom? How did it get to HUD and then attached to a HUD internal document? I guess that's the confusion that surrounds it. You wrote it and you gave it to whom? Is that question addressed to me, Ms. Congressman? Yes, that's correct. Sometime in, uh, I would say it was the spring of 1986, uh, I visited uh, with Mr. Manafort and indicated to him that I was interested in developing a privatization program for uh, some already existing uh, FHA housing in the state of Connecticut, housing that was very troubled. It was troubled under its public management. And I asked Mr. Uh, Manafort, once I was introduced to him, uh, if he would introduce me to the proper people in HUD so that I could present my proposal to them. If I may interrupt, was that the Beardsley Terrace and Pequannock or Pequannock? yes. Pequannock. Exactly. Apartments in Bridgeport. Specifically. Thank you. Uh, I was introduced first by Mr. Manafort to uh, Deborah Dean, uh, who was at that point in time the executive assistant to Sam Pierce. Uh, to be quite frank and candid, she was not uh, aware of the program specifically that I was trying to uh, ask HUD to be interested in, which was the- ended up in, with whom in what shop, in what office? Eventually, I ended up with uh, uh, Mr. Bao, uh, Jim Bao, B-A-U-G-H. Would you identify him, please, to the record? Uh, he was an assistant secretary, I think, for public housing, or he was the acting assistant secretary for public housing. I mean, his title, uh, uh, I don't know at that particular time whether he, whether he was the general deputy assistant secretary or he was the acting assistant secretary for public housing. But I, I did I end up with Mr. Bao. I realize that it's a huge agency and very confusing to those of us who are now studying it every day. But I think what confuses me mm -hmm. a bit is that we have a note from John Mooring, mm -hmm. who is a special assistant to the under secretary. Do you have any idea how it got to John Mooring's desk? I have no idea. But you originally gave it to Mr. Bott. Well, you originally gave it to that gentleman. 
to refresh as far as you recall. I would I may have left a copy with uh, uh, Deborah Dean. This was my this was my idea, uh, Congressman. This was my proposal. This right. this could have been left with Deborah Dean also. In essence, this is your proposal, the way you wrote it, and has now been it is now considered an internal uh, HUD document attached to the memo of September 16th from John to Deborah, and then with the handwritten note from Deborah back to John. That is your document. You're the author. I'm the author of this document. Attached to that memo. Attached to this memorandum. Now, let's go to the second memo. I guess I'll return to Mr. Manafort here. James Baugh, B-U-G-H, Ph.D., General Deputy Assistant Secretary, so you have the title correct, as of October 30th, 86. Now, it says this is from Deborah Dean, uh, I'm sorry, to Deborah Dean from Mr. Baugh. This is a write-up on Bridgeport, Connecticut, privatization proposal projects, Connecticut 45-2, 4 and 7. You may wish to forward a copy to Paul Manafort. Would this committee understand it better if it said you may wish to copy, uh, forward this copy to Mr. Cruz? They're sending it to Manafort by mistake. Is that correct? Or am I assuming something? Well, the, the question is to me, Congressman, as I indicated, uh, the, Ms. Dean may not have ever remembered Mr. Cruz, but the point is this is not my proposal, which I think is the thrust of your question. We accept that, or I accept that. And, and I all have I'm no involvement to, in it. All I'm trying to determine is how these documents came into existence and why the, these apparently strange distribution. Now, as a personal note, Paul Manafort, FYI, D, which we assume to be Debbie, as the chairman noted, on the 5th of November. She's sending it to you because... She, she doesn't remember Mr. Cruz's name or doesn't remember meeting Mr. Cruz? I, I can't speculate to that, Congressman. I, I, the only thing I can, you know, I'm willing to acknowledge is the fact that I introduced Mr. Cruz into the HUD system so he could introduce his proposal. Uh, but why I continue to be on correspondence, uh, I, I don't know. Then we do assume, or we can assume, hopefully at this time, that this internal document, uh, memo for Tom Sherman, Director of Office of Public Housing, from Joseph Galetich, or Galetich, Assistant General Counsel, is in direct response to the proposal that Mr. Cruz developed and submitted to HUD. Is that correct? That's what it appears to be as without having read know. the document, which would be natural since it was response to something he was asking HUD to consider. All right. Now let me go back to basics. We mentioned in the beginning apparently erroneously, an 80% occupancy rate. I'd like to just examine what is going on now at the Seabrook um, project. If you have 160, you say 180? 182. 182 100. occupants are in units that are completed. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Right. The instant, uh, I think, the Sanchez family, did that occur in a completed project unit? Except for the gutters and spouts, that, that's me. my understanding. No, no. I, that's I'm my understanding. Gutters, the house, gutters and spouts, just a moment. The collapse uh, internally within the unit occupied by, I think, the Sanchez family, which the uh, incident the chairman raised with you, with which you said you were familiar, did that occur in an ostensibly completed unit? Is that one of the occupied units? Yes, sir. All right. Can you once again explain if the unit is completed? Was that an oversight? Was that shoddy workmanship? Was it something you uh, failed to, um, to to know? I mean, how, how could that have occurred? Sir, and is that a common occurrence? Which is there, more there are 182 important. completed units. That is the only one that, to the best of my knowledge, had that problem, sir. Okay. Now, of the remaining units, uh, I guess 44, how many are under construction? Are all the remaining units under construction? Yes, sir. What is the estimated date of completion? For those units? We expect no, sometime in November of this year. All right. Now let me go to the most puzzling aspect of this for me. We're now talking, you're 80% completed, more or less, and we're talking about downspouts and gutters at this late stage of development. Is this not an issue that is usually addressed prior to the signing of the contract? Congressman, in construction projects, there's no such thing as usual. Uh, and uh, it, it varies by the negotiations that are going on back and forth. Congressman? If, if I'm, yes. If I may. Gutters and uh, downspouts were not a part of our original proposal and uh, were not originally a requirement of the, uh, of the BOCA <laughs> code or the local uh, 
building code, but the... Forgive me, but for $31 million, they don't have gutters? For $31 million, <laughs> Congressman, the $31 million uh, figure does not relate to the actual rehab of the units. The $31 million relates to the subsidy that will be provided to the individuals. But it's money out of taxpayers' pocket going to pay for this project, is that correct? Uh, over 15 years. Over 15 years. But pardon me. Okay. I understand that. We can get that at the moment if you want. But I'm trying to say for, for total cost of $31 million up front, gutters and downspouts are not figured in that cost estimate. Sir, the $31 million is not a number that exists in the rehab at this stage. That is a number that in 15 years will be the amount of subsidy that the federal government has provided to this project. What we are putting into rehab, which I think is maybe the thrust of your question, is, is somewhere around $8 million. That's my next question. Now, you also have, first of all, you're in an area now I didn't want to get into yet, but let me finish off by gutters and downspouts. Your figure that you're giving me for the cost of this project is $8 million. No, sir. The, the total cost of this project will be somewhere in the range of $12 million, ultimately. I was giving you the rehab cost, which has to be combined with the purchase price. We Thank purchased you. the property for approximately $4.5 million. The original rehab proposal that was approved by the city and the Public Housing Authority required another approximate $6 million uh, in rehab, or what we thought at that time was going to be close to $11 million. Uh, I am led to believe, uh, and Mr. Cruz can verify these numbers, that a number of change orders since that approval have occurred, of which I believe Mr. Cruz is saying these gutters and spouts is one of them. Uh, and we have agreed to additionally uh, rehab those, uh, those, uh, those other requirements. They weren't part of the original agreement, which anticipated spending, I believe, $11 million, Victor? That's correct. Well, I want to use your figures to be as fair as possible. But I have to tell you, because I come to the Midwest, which is not nearly as expensive as Washington, D.C., and apparently it's not nearly as expensive as Seabrook. W would you live in a home, would you buy a home without gutters and downspouts? Is that question? I'll take both of you. You can go first, but you can I'd like to respond to that, Congressman. The objective of our rehab, you have to understand that when I first saw the project in Seabrook, New Jersey, the condition of the project was such that uh, I don't know how to describe it other than the way that uh, Congressman Lantos had described it as uh, Mayor Peterson has described it prior to, prior to our appearance on the site. The 326 units were in a state of disrepair that, in my opinion, was alarming. And so uh, our plan, our rehab plan, started with this base to bring the projects back to a housing code, a minimal housing code, because you have to understand that there were over 300 families living there when I arrived on the site. It wasn't like I was coming in and all the units were totally unoccupied. There were black and Hispanic people already living there in conditions that I thought, based upon my experience, was, uh, I mean, cruel and unusual punishment. And so when we, when we designed the rehab, we started with the basic minimums. If you're asking me whether gutters and downspouts are more important than uh, a proper uh, uh, toilet facility, my answer would be no. I'll just stay with Mr. Cruz for a moment since he's obviously more familiar with the on-site development. Absolutely. Now, I'll accept that for now. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on a little bit further in the stage of development for this project. Was it your intent originally, given the minimal standards that you referred to, housing standards, to have gutters and downspouts at any eventual stage until recently when the issue was then joined by the local housing authority or the city, the town of Deerfield, Upper Deerfield. Congressman, my initial intent was to create a housing project that everyone connected with could be very proud of. That is still my intent. There is a manner in which you handle a process like this. You do a rehab and then through the course of uh, when the project becomes occupied and income begins to flow in, you do a regular reserve maintenance and repair program. I cannot specifically say to you that gutters and downspouts were a part of our original agenda, but they would have been a part of the agenda as we had gone through. Uh, the intention is to create decent, safe, and affordable housing with this program. That is what the Section 8 Moderate Rehab Program is designed to do. 
Is it fair to say that eventually, with the establishment of cash flow, you would have moved into the arena of negotiating or creating, actually, gutters, building the gutters, and establishing downspouts eventually? Absolutely. Thank you. So what's at issue now is that apparently, if I have this correct, from your standpoint, mm -hmm. that Upper Deer, the town of Upper Deer, Deerfield, or township, whichever is correct, and the spokespeople for that political unit have come to you and they want to advance the date or deadline for the establishment of gutters and downspouts. That and other items also, Congressman. The officials in Upper Deerfield have made a decision that they wanted to pass additional ordinances, ordinances that we were not aware of at the time that we purchased, ordinances that we weren't even aware of after we started the rehab. So they made a decision to uh, create additional ordinances and, and additional requirements. So they have changed the legal playing field. Correct. Since the date of the contract signed. Correct. To which they were a signatory. They were not a signature to it. All right. So they're not bound by the contract limits as such, and it's totally within their purview to do this if they like. They were not a signature to the contract, uh, Congressman, but they were a part of the review process because our plans and our specifications had to be reviewed by the building code uh, official. And, it, and they were uh, reviewed by the building code official. Well, I, I will lean heavily, though, on the perception, if not the reality, in prior testimony that they were literally ignored until the latter stages of this contract. Ignored? Congressman, I, don't, I do not think that that is the case. Well, that would have been one of my follow-on questions. You care to address that now? No, no Congressman. If I just may say this, in, the, in prior testimony by the mayor, we were given to believe that while they welcomed it and wanted it, it wasn't exactly what they wanted. They had very little say about it. It was either take this whole unit this way or nothing. Now, that's the perception left with me as a single member, so you might address that if you like. Let me first reference it to my other test, my previous testimony, and then Mr. Cruz can actually give you many more specifics because he was involved in it. The mayor indicated that it was late August that he got involved in the rehab process. What Mr. Cruz is speaking about now as far as the rehab plan that was approved that was subsequently been the subject of change orders uh, in, in, be, that were beyond the scope that the parties had all agreed to began in August and ran through October. So while the city wasn't a party to the contract, they were involved in creating the rehab plan, which was the basis of the scope of work that began on November 30. And since November 30, the city has, has changed the ordinances. And we've negotiated with them and agreed to over, you know, the last number I heard was 30 change orders of significance, which has increased cost to us. But we're going along with them, one of which is the curbs and, I mean, the gutters and the spouts. So at least from your standpoint, if not from mine, the reason for the towns now playing with the um, certificate of occupancy is that that's the one leverage they have on you in regards to the negotiation process. Would you say as a pretty good hammer? Uh, they are certainly using it as a hammer. I can't speculate as to why they're doing it, or as to motivations or things, though. Well, uh, in answer to that specific uh, question, Congressman, it's been a very effective hammer. It is a hammer that, uh, in effect, the town has had from day one. But I'd like to take you back just, just one uh, to frame for you, uh, Congressman, that the town has not been involved uh, since day one because the, uh, the, the beginning of this program leads you to a public housing agency. And a public housing agency, such as a local housing authority, did not exist in Seabrook at the time that we first discovered this project. At the time that we first discovered this project, Seabrook did not have a housing officer. At the time that the, uh, we discovered this project, Seabrook had a part-time building code inspector. Uh, I, d I discovered that in my due diligence when I was trying to determine who would be the administrating agent for this Section 8 for these mod rehab units. And as is the case in Connecticut, when there is not a local housing authority, the state agency responsible for this type of housing will come in and oversee it. And that is the specific reason why the Department of Community Affairs was contacted. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to abbreviate some of the line of question I want because I think we've gone over it many times. I know now I feel like a lot of the testimony is merging in some way 
reading uh, recollection is now merging as to what really happened to the project. But let me leave this one criticism that keeps, it, it just keeps reappearing as far as I'm concerned when I list the testimony. One of the weaknesses of the system is, apparently, that these projects can be granted at the top and pushed down upon an unwilling, not that they're unwilling, but upon an unwilling locale or city or township. And I'm concerned, it, I guess of all these things, I'm concerned about the apparent lack of communication and consultation with a receiving community before they're presented with a fait accompli that, hey, here's your housing project, take it or leave it. I'm really concerned about that. And of all the things I've heard, uh, the, the um, extraordinary amounts of consulting fees going into the project notwithstanding, this bothers me most of all. Because as the representative of dozens of the communities, which can't seem to get any loans for housing, I find that uh, you know it, the decision made at the top, and maybe there's some intermediate bureaucracies, but not down at the bottom where the people have to live with it. So I just want to leave that with you, because that bothers me. I think of all the testimony we heard, that bothers me most of all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman, would you mind if I responded to that? Um, yes, of course. Congressman, I was a housing official in Connecticut for five years, and uh, I understand how home rule has become uh, uh, a very favored uh, aspect uh, for a lot of people in small locales. But in the case where you have uh, the need for housing, especially for low and moderate income people, many who are black and Hispanic, who do not have the opportunity to uh, find themselves in rural conditions or in conditions that uh, uh, would not favor uh, home rule, where a mayor would decide that he would never want low and moderate income housing. I think that is the specific reason why public housing agencies on a statewide basis are given the opportunity to administer programs like this. And in this specific case, there were 326 units, of which 300 were already occupied by low and moderate income people. And so, in this specific case, the local people weren't contacted specifically, but yet, the mechanism that was used followed the rule brick and was, and was done according to what I understood the rules to be. Well, Mr. Cruz, your, record, your answer is a matter of record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Go over the chronology again with me. When did the construction begin? Let me, let me address this to Mr. Cruz because I gather he was most involved with that. Uh, Congressman, the construction started in December of 1987. Okay, and here we are now in October of 1989, and what, 80% of the construction is complete? Is that what you've said? I would think that would be a correct answer. And when will the other 20% be complete? I would think that the 20%, which is ongoing, yeah. uh, should be complete, barring no complications, uh, sometime at the uh, end of November, the very beginning of December. Okay, and how long have people been living inside the project? How long have people During been the period of construction, were there people living in there all along? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And in the discussion that you were having with Mr. Lukens about the uh, lack of uh, gutters and, and runners and spouts, uh, it, does that apply to all the building, all the units? That was a condition that was present prior to our purchase. That was a condition that continued throughout the rehab. And continues to this moment? No, we are presently uh, putting gutters and downspouts on the buildings. To what extent has that been done? Uh, I can't answer the specific. 10%, uh, 15%, 60%? Congressman, I do not want to give when you When did answer. you start putting gutters and snipes in? We started uh, initiating the, the gutters and downspout program about uh, three or four weeks ago. But we had agreed to put gutters and downspouts on from the very first temporary certificate of occupancy. That was not something that, uh, because of the town's uh, specific uh, declaration that they wanted gutters and downspouts, we agreed to do that from the very first temporary certificate of occupancy. Okay, and why do you have to have gutters and downspouts? Why do we have to have yeah. them? Uh, 
there's two specific reasons why we have to have gutters and downspouts. Why does anybody have to have gutters and downspouts? Well, gutters and downspouts are uh, usually to take water away from the buildings if there is a water problem. There are other construction designs that can require you not to have gutters and downspouts. But these require them, right? So the units that you have here require them. Not initially. This is a decision that the town made, that they wanted gutters and downspouts. Right. They passed an ordinance. Because without it, what happens? What happens to the buildings? What happens to the buildings without yeah. gutters and downspouts? Yeah. I, I don't want to speculate what, what is going to happen to the buildings, Congressman. I don't know what would happen to the buildings without gutters and downspouts. Well, they survived it, 40 years without them. Well, it survived uh, from the description that you gave of those units. Survival is hardly the word that, that well, maybe it's the only word that you can use, is that, that, that they survived. But they, whether they were, in fact, habitable or, or well habitable is another issue. And I, I, my assumption is that you have gutters and downspouts in order to have, not to have the water jam up at the, at the roofs and at the corners and at the eaves, so that, in fact, it doesn't affect the condition of the, of the roof and of the electrical wiring and so on. It, it makes for a continuing of a, of a solid unit. Isn't that correct? I, I really don't know whether that's correct or not, Congressman. So that for all of these years that people have been putting gutters and downspouts in, they've been doing it because why? There are architectural designs I have been led to believe, I can speak on this, that would uh, make gutters and downspouts not such a great issue as we're making of it right now. In addition to that, the main reason why have you, in fact, noticed that, that there has been conditions caused by the accumulation of water in those units? I am only aware of one condition, uh, and I was just made aware of that. And as I have been involved in housing over the number of years that I've been involved in housing, that is something that can happen in any housing project when you have the amount of rain that we have had over the course of the last uh, three or four months, Congressman. You know that New Jersey has had heavy rains before? I'm sure New Jersey has had heavy rains. Uh, it, 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 it just seems strange to me. But, Congressman, we were not trying to avoid putting gutters and downspouts on. We had to make a rehabilitation decision. What would be our priorities as it related to the, the decent, safe, and sanitary conditions for these people? Gutters and downspouts are an outside condition. It, it, and the specific reason why the town wanted gutters and downspouts were site-related. Those were the reasons that they gave us. It was site-related. What, what does site-related mean to they you? They were concerned about whether or not the site, there would, there would be draining water off the site of the buildings, whether it would be mud coming down into parking areas. Those were the reasons why they wanted gutters and downspouts. Those were the specific reasons. Valid reasons? I, I, I do not say that they're not valid, but our decisions were based upon the internal unit, the internal occupancy of the building. That's where we placed our emphasis when we put the rehabilitation program together. Now, I, I, I would say that if you have a limited number of dollars to do a rehabilitation project, of which Section 8 Mod re Rehab is, that you would put more emphasis in the internal portion where people are going to be living rather than in the external portion. Except that ultimately, if in fact the water accumulates and it comes down and ruins the walls and the roofs, and wounds the wiring, that that affects the internal living conditions of the people who occupy those units, wouldn't you say? I would say that that specific uh, statement is correct, Congressman, but we hired an engineer uh, during the time that the town was complaining about not only the gutters and downspouts, but roofs. We hired an engineer, and we had that engineer go on site and give us an evaluation not only of the roofs, but of the need for gutters and downspouts. And the report that we got was that the buildings could survive without gutters and downspouts, and that, in, in effect, many of the roofs that were also complained about had a life expectancy of about five to six years. But in order to be of a cooperative, of a cooperative manner, we agreed to put gutters and downspouts in. We Would agreed. the chairman yield on that point? Yeah, I'd be the, down, the gutters and downspouts are not there to preserve the roof. I didn't they're, they're, work they're there while you said they had a life expectancy as was a determination by a building inspector who indicated that uh, that would be no great danger and evidently that was not the reason that they needed the downspots and gutters right away. That's not true. If that's what you're trying to indicate, the reason you have downspots and gutters is to 
stop the accumulation of water in certain places to make sure the water runoff doesn't cause any other damage. That's the reason. You're correct, Carl. And when you finish the phase of building or construction in any community, that building inspector has, before he gives a complete occupancy permit, needs to make sure that those phases are completed. I agree. And your phase building, if you're completing some and getting occupancy permits for some, you're not going to get that occupancy permit until that particular phase of that facility is completely safe in the eyes of the local authority. I agree 100 percent, Congressman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Well, I, I'm not going to belabor the point any longer, but it seems to me that from your own description, you find here a situation which is, as you said, an extremely, I guess, dangerous is, or alarming is, is the word that you used, uh, situation. Uh, and you come in and because it is the kind of project that seems to me to be most remunerative to the consultants and the people who purchase these things, you go ahead and you take a project that the people within that community think is a waste of money. And when you get through, I mean, we have photographs here as to what the condition of some of those buildings is and what the buckling of the walls may be at this point. Uh, it's scandalous. And, I, and, you know, you can put the best possible face on it, but it seems to me with the kind of monies that we're talking about here, uh, we could have had much better housing available for the kind of money that was spent. But let me, let me go back because this is your first appearance before the committee. And uh, when Mr. Manafort first appeared, uh, he testified that in essence, and I think he repeated some of that in this testimony, that in essence uh, the, the, the finding of this particular uh, piece of property was yours. And so what I'd like to do is to have you help us uh, go through how you got to this property. Mm -hmm. Before that, how you got to Mr. Manafort. How, how far back does your relationship with Mr. Manafort go? I met Mr. Manafort for the first time in spring of 1986. Uh, I would say specifically uh, probably the month of May. I met Mr. Manafort for the first time. And what were the circumstances? I was uh, inquiring of Mr. Manafort uh, concerning a privatization of a public housing project in the state of Connecticut. You, but at that point, you were in the private sector? That's correct. And how did you happen to hear of Mr. Manafort? Uh, mutual friends. Mutual friends, really. Mutual friends, Congressman. Mutual friends. Could you be more specific about that? A gentleman by the name of Brian McNamara, who I was. Would you that spell that for us? I don't know if I can spell it. Oh, Ma Macama? McNamara. McNamara, okay. Right. Of who I was then presently involved in another development project uh, in the city of Hartford, uh, a project in an enterprise zone in the city of Hartford. Right. And uh, I had mentioned the privatization project to Mr. McNamara. Uh, and I indicated to him that it was a, uh, a, HUD pro a HUD project at that particular point in time that I was interested in privatizing. And he indicated to me that a person who might be of help to me would be Mr. Manafort. And I said I would be certainly willing to talk to Mr. Manafort about that. And that's how I got to meet Mr. Manafort. Okay. And where did you meet him? What was the nature of your conversation with him? I met him in uh, Alexandria, and I indicated to him through the, uh, the basis of this proposal. Had you telephoned him before for a meeting? No, I didn't telephone Mr. Manafort. I don't remember telephoning Mr. Manafort. Mr. McNamara probably did all of that, but I don't have a, 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 a concise recollection okay. of making a call. And you then told him that you had, you had an interest in privatization, this program of HUD, and then what, what did you ask of him? I inquired of him whether or not uh, he could put me in touch with some people at HUD so that I could discuss my proposal. And what did he say? He said that he thought he could. And then what happened? Uh, I don't remember the exact date and time, uh, Congressman, but I met with, uh, at some point in time, in the early part of uh, September, I met with Mr. Manafort and Deborah Dean, who was then the executive assistant to Secretary Pierce, and I explained uh, to her my idea about privatization. Okay. In any event, we had the discussion about that, and that sort of didn't go any place ultimately. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. But your relationship with Mr. Manafort continued. How? Well, uh, I developed a great deal of respect for Mr. Manafort, and I assume that he uh, 
same with me. And I was continuing trying to uh, put a development company together. Uh, I was in the private sector now. And so uh, Mr. Manafort and I decided uh, at some time, and I would think it was uh, the end of September, beginning of October, to put a development company together. And at that time, did you have any particular properties in mind? I didn't have, well, I had been contacted by a developer, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Pierre, who called me up and said to me that uh, there was a project in New Jersey that he thought that I would be particularly interested in because I was black. That was, those were kind of his exact words. Right. And so I didn't give it a great deal of attention in the early part of the month, but because I was exploring, because I was interested in being a developer, I decided to make a trip to New Jersey, which I did. And, and but at the same time, I had a relationship going with Mr. Manafort on inquiring and uh, uh, indicating to him that I was going to be interested in finding projects to do. And whose idea was it to do a mod rehab? Was that your idea, his idea? Uh, it was my idea, Congressman, because I was very familiar with the Mod Re Rehabilitation Program and all the benefits that inured as a result of the Mod Rehab Program. And so you went to New Jersey when? Sometime in either the end of September or the beginning of October. I can't specifically and remember. And where in New Jersey did you go? What did you do? I went to Seabrook. Uh-huh. Uh, I can remember quite distinctly driving down uh, past all of the uh, pear farms and the fruit farms and saying to myself, now I know that there's not going to be any low and moderate income housing on this road. It just doesn't seem logical that there would be. But lo and behold, after going down far enough, I did find that project. And it was uh, uh, at that present time under the ownership of a gentleman by the name of C.J. Shea. C.J. Shea. O'Shea. O'Shea. A-C-H-E-E. -E. Yes. And so what I did was I began to, because I knew Mr. O'Shea was interested in selling his project, because Mr. Piera had been in the, in the process of trying to put the project together himself, uh -huh. I went in, began to inquire of Mr. O'Shea if he was still interested in selling his project. And? And he said, yes, he was. And so what I began to do at that particular point in time was to look at the units. I brought an architect down. I brought a construction person down. And I asked them whether or not they thought these units could be rehabilitated, whether or not they thought it had a, a continuing life expectancy. I just did a, a general developer's due diligence, nothing you know, overwhelming, nothing spectacular, but just the day-to-day -day due diligence that a developer would do. And, and uh, I came away feeling that I had found uh, a project that not only would be something that I would be very proud of in terms of doing real rehabilitation on, but I walked away with the uh, feeling that I was going to be doing something that would be helping the 300 and some odd families that all, were already living there. Right. And did, did, was it at that point that you and Mr. Manafort decided to create the development company? I can remember distinctly how we created the development company. I but, asked but, but, but before that, before you, you tell me that, I asked you, did you, was it at that point that you decided to form the development company? Uh, I don't know. I, I can't, I, I don't know whether it was at that specific point in time, Congressman. It wasn't before you saw the units that you decided to form a development company. I can't say that that is true either, Congressman. I, I don't know the specific... Your mind is totally blank on the issue? No, I don't think I have a blank mind, Congressman. I think I can speak to your points effectively, but I just well, tell, don't have... Tell me, I do tell not me have in relation to your visit to New Jersey, mm -hmm. whether the Development Corporation uh, creation was decided upon before or after? I would probably say before, Congressman, because I was looking at another project also at the same time. There were other projects that I was also interested in. And when, when did, this, did this visit take place? The visit to New Jersey? Yeah. The visit to New Jersey either took place at the very end of September or the beginning of October. And when did the visit to, uh, to HUD on the uh, privatization project take place? Sometime in the spring, 
Uh, well, I can't specifically. My first visit to Mr. Manafort took place in the spring of 1986 when I first mentioned the privatization program to him. Yes, but do you, you then subsequently went and met with Ms. Dean. That's correct. And when did that take place? I don't remember specifically the date. I'm sure that uh, uh, I don't remember specifically the date. Okay. Right. Anyhow, you, you, you saw these units and you had been what in, in, in heart you'd been in Connecticut? I was the deputy commissioner of the State Department of Housing. Department of Housing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was your, your judgment and conclusion after seeing those units that, in fact, that's the kind of unit project on which you thought that HUD monies ought to be spent for rehabilitation. Is that correct? It was my judgment that this was the type of housing that would be very beneficial in re project on which you thought that HUD monies ought to be spent for rehabilitation. Is that correct? It was my judgment that this was the type of housing that would be very beneficial in rehabilitating using the Section 8 Mod Rehab Program. And what was your judgment as to the kind of monies that it would take to bring those 326 units up to standard? I didn't make a judgment at that time on the amount of money, Congressman. When did you make that judgment? After a great deal of uh, due diligence, using contractors, architects, uh, financial people, uh, using the resources of the Public Housing Agency, uh, which is the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, over the course of uh, using local building uh, uh, code inspectors also, because the decision, the final decision on the rehabilitation didn't actually take place until much later in the, in the year of and 1987. And what, what figure did you ultimately arrive at as to the amount that would be needed? <coughs> Well, in the, in the rehab process, it is not a question of an ultimate figure. In the rehab process, what you're trying to determine is how much money can be supported by the income that is generated from the project to determine the rehabilitation. Well, but, but here, here you found a situation which was disastrous by your own description. You, uh, you, you I don't think I said disastrous, Congressman. Alarming. Is, is the word yes, that it was alarming. alarming. It was okay. alarming. You found a situation that was alarming. And so I assume that if you found a situation that was alarming, you were not only considered with how much rehabilitation could take place, depending on how much money would be thrown off by rents, but you were also concern, concerned about what, how much money would be required to make the, those units really habitable. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay. And what, what figure did you come to? At what point in time are you looking for that figure? After you've gone through with all of your engineering analyses and you've, you've gone through all of your numbers crunching and so on, what conclusion did you come to as to what would be needed to make those units habitable? Not how much money would be thrown off and it would be available, how much would be needed? We did not make a determination on habitability. Okay. Uh, they were already ha being inhabited. It wasn't a determination of habitability. They were already inhabited. Well, I, listen, you, Mr. Cruz, you've seen units that people live in. Absolutely. It doesn't make them habitable necessarily. They're there because they got no choice. Isn't that correct? That is absolutely correct, Congressman. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, here we were going to be spending large amounts of federal monies not to keep people in the same condition in which they were, but in fact to give them better housing. Isn't that correct? That's exactly what we're doing. So I, I don't understand why habitability wasn't an issue at all. It would seem to me that habitability would, would be one of your prime concerns, but never mind. Let's go on to your discussions with, with Mr. Ashe. Okay. Uh, tell me how that developed. Well, uh, Mr. Ashe was interested in selling his units. He thought he had, uh, because he had 300 and some odd uh, occupancy, occupants, because he was collecting rent on uh, a regular basis, that he had a project that uh, was, in his mind, very successful. Okay. I, I, in turn, was interested in putting together a development project. And I was coming from the state of Connecticut, where in Hartford, in Stanford, in New Haven, in Bridgeport, units, even units such as the units that I had looked at in New Jersey, what you're saying, I would have the same alarm, would sell for twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars a unit. I was negotiating with Mr. Uh, Ashe at a rate far below that kind of figure. And to be quite frank, the four point four million dollars 
even though I tried to negotiate Mr. O'Shea and did negotiate Mr. O'Shea down from his original $4.9 million, I negotiated him down about $500,000. I was, in my mind, thinking that the deal, because it was about $13,000 a unit, was a very fair amount of money for the 326 units. And so what we actually, we agreed that we would try to continue putting together uh, a sale on the project. Okay, and then what happened? What were the terms of the deal? Uh, the terms weren't settled immediately. We were still in, the, and we were still in the, the process of doing due diligence as it related to what we were gonna do with the project. And Mr. O'Shea had indicated to me, or was at least trying to indicate that there was another buyer in the wing somewhere. And these discussions went on from starting when? When did you have your first meeting with Mr. O'Shea? Sometime in either the end of September or the beginning of October. And they went on through when? When did you sign your first contract? Beginning of January. And what was that contract for? Uh, I think that contract was for a limited option period, and it cost us about $25,000. Okay, and then there came a time when you had another contract. That's correct. When was that? Uh, I think that was in February of uh, 1987. And did you have to put more money up at that point? Yes, How we much? did. I think another $25,000. Seventy-five hundred. Seventy-five hundred. Seventy-five hundred. Yes. Seventy-five hundred When did the time come when you had to put down four hundred and fifty thousand dollars? In April. Okay. Now, did did you did you know at that time that Mr. O'Shea had additional units available in in uh, Th that same community? Yes, I did, Congressman. And did you have a discussion with him as to whether, as to what you were going to be doing with the property? Did I have a discussion? Yeah. I did not have a discussion with uh, Mr. O'Shea about going after Section 8 My Rehab Units. No, I didn't. Uh, I did have a discussion with Mr. O'Shea about the contact that he had with the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. Because at the present, at the time that I began negotiations with uh, Mr. O'Shea, and all during the time that I was in negotiations with uh, Mr. O'Shea, there were Section 8 existing units that were being used in the units. And did you know whether he was going to be making any, did he, did he have any applications pending for HUD subsidies? I do not know, Congressman. You never asked him? No, I did not. You have the Section 8 certificates, though. I already just said that. So that so that, in fact, you never, you never at, at any time t attempted to protect yourself from Mr. O'Shea going in and competing with you for units? I thought I was protecting myself by not mentioning it, Congressman. And did you ever have any indication that Mr. O'Shea was making application to compete with you? I can't say that I had any specific indication that he was in competition with me, no. At any time during the course of, of, the, of the pending of, of the approval by HUD? I thought that Mr. O'Shea could be in competition with me at any time, and that's why I did not mention any of my knowledge, my expertise to Mr. O'Shea. Did you have any indication that, in fact, he had made any applications or was intending to make any applications? I had no indication, in fact. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That means he's aware of it. Oh, very much. Yeah, I said that, though. Of course. Congressman Carl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.